morning, everyone. Hope everyone uh, got here safely. Uh, a little bit of snow today, so that means there can't be climate change, right? Um, this is going to be a fairly interesting, I think, uh, introduction to climate change. Most folks know about climate change that are uh, aware of it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, in ways that will help you explain it to other people, because that's generally uh, one of the big problems we have is communication on climate change. Um, so Stephen spoke about a bit of my background. Um, so I've been an environmental journalist for 25 years, writing for a variety of publications around the world. These are the ones I write for currently. I focus on international stuff, mostly because uh, when I first started out, uh, uh, Canadian publications where I'm from weren't particularly interested in environmental issues, contrary to Canada's reputation for being green. It's not particularly green, um, sadly. Um, so I've forced me to uh, uh, develop uh, uh, an interest in the rest of the world, which has been hugely beneficial to myself and my understanding of many, many things. Um, we're going to start off way up north. So Svalbard is part of Norway. It's, um, it's an island called, also called Spitsbergen. And it's the furthest north where there's permanent year-round habitation. Uh, so it's, I forget, I think it's, forget the exact, uh, uh, 78 degrees, 79 degrees. It's way up. It's the super high Arctic snow there all year round, it's, it's real Arctic, real Arctic, you know, home of polar bears. Um, I was up there uh, at the invitation of the Norwegian government to, to be part of a special session involving business leaders, uh, political leaders from China, uh, India, um, scientists, uh, to talk informally about climate change. This is about four or five years ago. Um, and it was an off-the-record discussion, um, which is, you know, I guess the only way they could get journalists and all these folks together. And it was done up at a research station, a scientific research station um, um, called Noi Alessund, if I got the Norwegian right. Uh, unique place. And for four days, we talked about climate change, various aspects, business stuff, uh, and so on. One of the interesting things that came out of that was that the Chinese ministers were talking about climate change, not so much from a global warming perspective, but from a uh, air pollution problem. And uh, as a, uh, uh, I guess, a misuse of resource by continuing to burn fossil fuels at such a rapid rate, there wouldn't be any left for future generations. That was certainly one of the stronger concerns of the Chinese, that they thought it was incumbent upon themselves to uh, not use so much, not to waste this particular resource. Um, India at the same time was just becoming aware of climate change, so that was interesting from the business uh, perspective. They hadn't really factored it in yet. But by the end, everybody sort of was on the same uh, playbook. Um, that's what it looks like up there. Um, this was the height of the summer, so it's 24 hours of light. Uh, it's not actually warm, even though you can see a little bit. Nothing grows up there, just lichen. So they got uh, reindeer, a bunch of birds. They have a lot of birds, polar bears, and polar bears that roam around there. Uh, beautiful in its starkness. Um, it's been snow all year round, so most of the time it's all covered in snow. So that's about the least amount of snow they would have. Uh, really stunning landscape. Uh, I was not fully prepared for Arctic, so I didn't have really warm stuff. Uh, but I still went for a hike because, you know, after you're cooped up for four or five days in a, uh, you know, sort of a conference setting, I, I, at least I do, I need to get out and roam around just to, you know, helps me think and process and also to experience the place. Um, yeah, so I went for a hike. And you can see my little backpack there. Uh, there's nothing. There means nobody, nothing for miles. You know, we climb to the top of the hill and you can't see anything because there isn't. There's uh, at most 1,000 people live up there. And in the winter, it's down to 250 because it's 24 hours of darkness and super cold for like four months of the year. 
Um, one thing I didn't count on uh, was they actually get like f almost like a snow fog, although it's not warm, but it's, it, it, you lose your uh, you know, ability to see very far. Um, and uh, again, I was by myself, which is usually when I have trouble uh, getting myself into trouble by hiking to a place I sh probably shouldn't have gone uh, and getting lost. There's no rescue in this kind of part of the world, and of course my cell phone didn't work because there's no cell reception. Um, but that wasn't really the big risk. It turned out when I got back to town, they said, oh, you just broke the law. Nobody's allowed to leave town without a gun because of the polar bears. Uh, and you can't get a gun in Norway easily. <laughs> Uh, the governor of the province of uh, or Svalbard has to approve you. Uh, licensing and all that still pretty well forces you to hire a guide. Um, because they said, well, you know, last year uh, in one of those hills uh, overlooking the town, you know, two tourists were killed by a polar bear. Because uh, it turns out polar bears are, <laughs> are hungry. They're hungry because there's nothing up there. Anything that moves, they figure they can eat it. Uh, and they can, because nothing's going to stop them. They also move really fast, because they've got really long legs. Like Their legs are like this, more like a horse kind of legs. And they're 1,100, 1,200 pounds. Uh, and they've got big, wide feet like that, so they can stay on snow unless it's really fluffy. Um, and you can see how far you could see, <laughs> huge distances. Meanwhile, the snow's up to my mid-thigh, and I wasn't moving very fast at all. Uh, yeah, so that's just sort of one of the dumb things uh, we tourists do sometimes in places we don't know very well, don't understand the landscape. And this is a kind of a metaphor for many things that happens throughout the world. We do a lot of dumb things because we just don't know any better. Somebody should have taken time since the guys to figure this, to find out more about the place before I went tromping off. Um, so. We're going to get back to the Arctic and how this is uh, all keys in a little bit later. So that's the beautiful little community. Yeah, it looks nice, right? But not if a polar bear was chasing you. Luckily for me, I did not see a polar bear. Part of me said, oh, I'd love to see a polar bear in the wild. Maybe from a ship, I wouldn't mind seeing a polar bear, but uh, not on the land. So this is the view of the Earth from the moon. And I contrast these images because, there's a, as you can see from the picture, there's a big difference between the moon and the Earth. So this is my climate change explanation in only 165 words. So the moon has no atmosphere. So that's why it's super hot, 100 C, which is way more in Fahrenheit. Uh, and really cold at night, like impossible to survive. Never mind the fact there's no oxygen. So our atmosphere is what makes the difference between the moon and the Earth. So we know that CO2 is a heat trapping gas. It's one of the several heat trapping gases. It's, it's one of the large ones that um, keeps our planet a nice comfy temperature. And we also know that burning fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal emits CO2, so carbon dioxide. This is long, been known for a really long time. So now we have measurements that show us there's now 46% more CO2 in the atmosphere than before the era of industrialization. So that's like putting an extra warm blanket on when you're already comfy cozy. So hence the term global warming. Um, these are sort of interchangeable terms. So the Earth is now 1C hotter, which is 1.4 Fahrenheit, I guess. Um, and heat is a form of energy. And that means all this additional heat that this 46% CO2 is uh, trapping in our atmosphere means there's a lot more energy for storms, a lot more energy to affect our weather, uh, more energy for heat waves. It's a, it's a fundamental shift in uh, our entire uh, climate. 
Uh, and in that 46% is increasing about 2% per year. Uh, to me, that's a much better way of talking about climate change, the 46% more CO2, than talking about parts per million, you know, 400 parts per million, or even the one degree thing. I think it's more meaningful to most people. But keep that in mind. So for 800,000 years, we had this lovely comfy blanket that we were constant temperature, and now we've added, well, that slide's a bit old, so uh, that extra blanket on top because of our emissions of fossil fuels. So with all this additional energy in the system, it would be physically impossible for there not to be some impacts. So this is the science-y stuff, right? Uh, the measurements of the um, temperatures and the variations. Uh, obviously it changes you know, from year to year because it's not a, it's a complicated climate system. So you can look at the data over a long period of time. In this case, it's from 1860. And you can see, you know, pretty well, there's a thousand different ways to chart this stuff, but it's always going up, 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 which makes perfectly good sense when you have 46% more CO2 trapping more heat. Another version of it, that's the parts per million graph. Uh, it's up to 410 now, actually. So this year will be 410 parts per million. So again, that's just another way of measuring the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And you know, to get that 46%, you just subtract from what the uh, average was, which was 280 over uh, 800,000 year period. So we've been in a fairly stable climate regime uh, for most of humanity's existence. And now we're in moving into a different state. Uh, and we don't really know all the things that are gonna happen. Another example of where our temperatures are, so this is the uh, differences in normal temperatures versus what the temperature was for that particular year. So you can see where the hot spots were in 2015. You could uh, have another version of this for more up-to-date. The, the hot places shift around a bit, although that little blue dot, which is really cold, um, is from the melting Arctic. The ice is melting and keeping the ocean in the North Atlantic much colder than it normally would be. And that's going to have an impact. Some suspect that this is where the North Atlantic uh, overturning circulation begins to fall apart. So that takes the Gulf Stream, the heat uh, off the coast of Florida, over to Europe. So Europe, under climate change, could get a lot colder because it's that big cold blob is blocking the heat from getting there. And that big, you know, because right below the, uh, right above the big cold blob, the blue blob, is uh, Greenland. And that ice is, there's a lot of ice up there, uh, and it's melting. Uh, other places in the world you can see, like the southern U.S. and Mexico and Central Africa uh, are getting hot uh, pretty well every year, breaking records. So most of the heat that's being trapped in our atmosphere from that extra 46%, thank God for the oceans. They're, it, they're absorbing 93.4% of all the heat. So, uh, in other words, if we didn't have the oceans, we would have already been fried. Uh, so the oceans are warming up naturally. Thank God the oceans are really cold, too. Uh, so they can absorb a lot of heat. But that's going to decline as the oceans warm. They can accept less heat. And so we'll get more heat on the surface. Um, so that's, we've been lucky so far, or we will be for a little while, but that's not going to continue forever. So one of the impacts of climate change has been the decline in the Arctic sea ice. And so over a relatively short period of time, uh, it's a fraction that's, that's in square kilometers. Um, but you can see that it's, done, it's, go, it's gone down uh, tremendously. So got to remember that the polar regions, north and south, are the drivers of our weather. So for eons, the cold parts of the north, you know, sort of compete with the hot part in the middle. So there's this, that is our generator of weather uh, for the entire planet. And so now we've got the northern part, the northern refrigerator uh, is defrosting. And so that's having a big impact on our weather. 
All of the impacts we're still not sure of, but we do know there are impacts happening, and there has to be simply because a big part of what drives our weather system is going through a fundamental change. Uh, this was shocking to me. This is just recently. So this is the Arctic ice extent, so the amount of ice in the middle of the coldest time of the year in the winter. And the blue line at the bottom is where it is. And the, uh, the gray lines uh, uh, in the shaded area, that's where it's supposed to be. And the difference is in terms of area. So the Arctic ice in the middle of winter, where it's 24 hours of darkness, there's now far less ice in the winter um, than there used to be. So that means even when it's super cold and super dark, the, the Arctic isn't forming enough ice. And the difference there is the size of Alaska, California, and probably Washington State. That's how much ice is now missing in the wintertime, uh, this year in particular. And I've asked scientists, you know, what the hell is going on? Why this year? And they don't know. Uh, this year was, you know, 2017 was a warm year, um, but not, wasn't the warmest year on record, it was like the third, I think it was, uh, or second. Um, but that didn't have the same effect on the ice the previous years. So I'm not sure why we're losing so much ice in the winter now. So that's a new thing. Um, and for Canada, well maybe less so for here, this is affecting the jet stream. And so our weather now has gotten really weird where it could be snowing up to here in the morning and then it rains that afternoon and washes away most of the snow and then all freezes that same night. So we're getting these really wild temperature fluctuations. Uh, Siberia had that one just a week ago probably due to this, although the scientists don't know, this is speculation. Uh, they had a 100 degree Fahrenheit switch in northern Siberia over a three day period. 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, so it went from what it's supposed to be like minus 50 Fahrenheit, because this is really far north and really cold area, to, you know, plus 10 or 6, or, you know, not plus 10, that's Celsius. I gotta do the conversion to Fahrenheit. Uh, to like uh, 50 degrees. Fahrenheit, in Siberia in the middle of winter, where it's also 24 hours of darkness. So, yeah, it's having some kind of effect. The cause and effect part from a science point of view isn't uh, certainly established yet, but there's no question there's an effect going on. So, that's the scientific consensus and has been for several years, and there's a number of other studies that have uh, documented the same thing, so all the research shows um, this is uh, what's going on. So who's responsible? Um, now, it used to be the U.S. was the biggest, so the big red ball there, that's the U.S., and the big blue ball on the right-hand side is China. So it was the U.S. was the biggest for most of uh, the last 50 years. Uh, China in the last three, four years has taken over for the U.S. Partially U.S. Emissions, uh, U.S. carbon emissions have gone down. China's continued to go up. Uh, but if you uh, had a little flag in every CO2 molecule in the atmosphere that humanity put up there, most of the flags would be waving the stars and stripes still. Because CO2 lasts forever. So when your car emits CO2, it's going to be in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. It doesn't go away. It stays there. And so all of the CO2 that's come from the U.S. in its 200-plus year history is still up there, and it will be up there for at least three, 400 years to come. Um, so that's why make acting on climate change now is very important because once the stuff is up there, we don't know how to get it out yet. But I'll talk a little bit about solutions a little bit later. So you can see uh, how things are changing. Asia now is becoming a bigger uh, source of CO2. However, uh, I'll say, you know, just below the big ball uh, is India, which is growing quick, quite quickly. But they are also switching to uh, alternative energy uh, very fast as well. So. There's some good news there. China also is cutting their coal consumption because it's air pollution is terrible there. 
And so they're finding other ways to generate energy, and so this is something that's uh, not entirely uh, doom and gloom. Now, generally speaking, those who um, contributed least to climate change are suffering the most and will suffer the most. So the small island states, you know, where places where people have already been forced to move because of s uh, sea level rise, they've got, you know, practically no CO2 emissions. Um, but everybody is being affected, some much more than others, in part because uh, they can, poorer countries have a hard time uh, coping with the changes from climate. Um, and you can see in the future, the bottom part of the graph is about vulnerability, so who's most likely to be impacted, or and it's part of it's a combination of how the climate's going to change and how they can handle those changes, how can they respond to the changes. In the U.S., you can build higher seawalls. In a place like Ghana, where the sea rises, is rising, they can't afford to build seawalls. So how come everybody doesn't know about this stuff? So this is the, a little bit out of date now, but the chart of uh, newspaper coverage. It hasn't improved much, I can say that. Uh, so one of my biggest challenges as a journalist is finding ways to get stories about climate change published. There's tons of research about it. Getting them published has been really difficult. Um, oh yeah, another climate change story. Uh, we're not interested. I mean, I've been to a lot of big uh, meetings and come across uh, a lot of scientists who have some break, breaking news, but I've been turned down more often than I've been, uh, had my stories accepted. And you saw that the big blip there was 2009. That was the climate change conference in Copenhagen. So that was the last time climate change got a huge blip. There was a, there'd be another blip, blip. They haven't done this, haven't updated this chart yet, uh, for the most recent uh, Paris climate change meeting, but it wasn't be as big as the Copenhagen one, uh, sadly. So that's one of the reasons why folks don't know about uh, about climate change. It's you know, some people I've been writing about it for 20 years. Um, scientists have known about it for 30, 40 years. Um, so there isn't that awareness, it isn't often not taught in schools, so the media is about the only way you're going to hear about it, uh, or from people talking about it generally. You notice the blue line, which is North America, you know, it, the coverage was less. Uh, so at the, a lot of these big climate meetings that I go to, you know, most of the journalists aren't from uh, North America. I'm usually the only Canadian, and there'll be like a handful of Americans. Uh, the rest will be eight people from Asia or other countries. Uh, so they, one reason there's a lot less climate denial in uh, the rest of the world is because they do better coverage, the Europeans and you know, even Africa. Um, they do a better job. So that's something that is starting to change, has changed in the last few years, ever since the Paris thing. So Paris was the last big climate change meeting, although it was, <laughs> It's uh, still, two, I think it's two years ago now, 2016. So 1.5 degrees was the decision. So in Paris, the, U, the world got together and said, all right, climate change really is serious, and maybe we're going to do something about it. Uh, and we're going to look at limiting the global temperature to 1.5, hopefully. Hopefully. Well, we're already at one degree, so that's going to be extremely difficult. But the big thing about Paris uh, was actually an agreement by all countries that we're going to phase out fossil fuels. It was absolutely the first time all the countries said, yes, we're going to get rid of fossil fuels. Their, you know, their day is done. And that's significant because all of these meetings are consensus-based. So any of the official statements, everybody has to agree on. So 198 countries, including Saudi Arabia, whose entire economy is based on selling fossil fuels, they had to agree to that. Um, it took 20 years to get to that statement. Um, so it's, it's been a very slow process, as you can see here from this graph of all the meetings. Um, so after the, the Warsaw one on the far right um, uh, it was the Paris COP20. Now, I haven't been to all of those meetings. I do know people who have been to every single one of those. Um, 
So that hasn't had an effect on the actual amount of emissions yet. So we're in the awareness part. We're now maybe turn the corner on understanding that we need to act and act quickly. Um, we're, this is a story I did for National Geographic uh, this summer. And we're also learning the damages, the costs of climate change, even in the US now, are in hundreds of billions of dollars. And they're only going to increase. Again, more energy in the climate system, more energy for storms. So hurricanes have become much more powerful. Uh, so the category five, uh, category four and five are, happen more often. Um, and so this last summer was uh, the most destructive year ever for the US in terms of hurricane damage. Um, and the projections are, of course, it's going to increase. And this is not, you know, the US is just one example. The same kind of thing is happening in other places too. Uh, in the Philippines, they get hit by typhoons, which is another term for hurricane. Uh, so often now, their parts of the country are regressing. They're not progressing. They're going back, you know, basically being typhoon bombed back into the Stone Age because they get storm after storm that destroys everything. And they can't afford to rebuild now in many parts of the country. So the impacts of climate change are becoming more obvious, becoming more expensive. But what hasn't really gotten through yet, I don't think, there's another story that I wrote, is that you can't solve a problem by making it worse. So that's the sort of point of this headline. You can't continue to build new things that use and burn CO2, because you're just making your problem worse. So in other words, in this sort of basic example, you can't keep building new coal plants. Because once a coal plant is built, uh, you're not going to tear it down five years later. It's going to continue to operate for 20, 30, 40 years and all the emissions. So this is uh, based on a study that looked at um, these, they call it emissions that we'd be committing to by building carbon infrastructure. So anything that burns carbon, uh, even a new car factored into this. So if you build whatever, 100 million new cars in 2018, those cars are going to operate for five or six, seven, ten years, and they're going to emit carbon, CO2. So you've got to account for that. So to stay below uh, two degrees, that means we'd have to stop building cars that build, uh, that burn CO2 in 2018. So that's not going to happen. Because there's, a li there's not much understanding of this particular fact, uh, you know, scientific fact, that if you build stuff, that, are, that is going to burn CO2. Uh, you're also, you're, it's not just the CO2 they're going to burn today, it's their, over their whole life, unless you're going to throw out hundreds of millions of cars or convert them somehow. And so by doing a bunch of calculations, they figured out that this would be sort of the year we'd have to cut it off. Otherwise, we'll be already committed to blowing our carbon budget and pushing ourselves beyond two degrees. It also has some financial implications because if, if you decide in a panic that we need to uh, avoid the two degree uh, increase, then we'd have to trash all of this new carbon burning stuff uh, to, make this, to make it possible. This isn't uh, very well known, unfortunately, so I've done like three versions of this story because that study didn't get hardly any coverage. In part because it was kind of a little bit complicated, not that easy to explain. Um, however, um, I think it's a f pretty important thing to just keep in mind. So when it comes to making decisions about what we're going to do, what industries we're going to support, um, um, stuff we're going to make, how we're going to run our economy, it sort of makes the point that you have to take the carbon uh, commitment that comes with these kinds of decisions seriously. Um, so that's something that uh, political leaders and business leaders need to understand. And uh, some are getting this message, uh, but it's coming slower. Um, so we're still looking at a three and a half to four degree uh, Celsius increase on a basis business as usual. Uh, converting that into Fahrenheit, six to seven degrees Fahrenheit increase. Now, the one thing to keep in mind that that's a global temperature increase. That doesn't mean the temperatures 
here are going to go up that much. They could go up a lot more. Uh, for instance, the Arctic, the temperature increase is already three degrees higher than it was um, 100 years ago. So while the planet is only heated up warmer by one degree uh, Celsius, it's three degrees Celsius warmer in the Arctic because the heat is uneven. Um, so the Arctic is warming up way faster than everywhere else. Also, heat, again, being another form of energy, you're, means you're gonna have, we're going to have a lot more energy in the system if we get to 3.5 to 4 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, and that's the business as usual uh, scenario we're right. That's the path we're on right now. Uh, despite the efforts of uh, those climate uh, um, change talks to reduce emissions, the commitments, the Paris Accords, all that kind of stuff, we're still in that. We haven't done enough, and the, and the promises and the commitments countries have made still does not get us into the safe zone. We've still got a long ways to go um, to cut emissions. All right, so we've got this uh, new reality, a climate, the new climate reality. Um, so part of what I'm hoping here is getting across the idea that things have to be a lot different than they are presently. Uh, the future is not going to be anything like the past. Um, and we're going to have to imagine uh, what that future looks like, how it can be different and better. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges we're having right now is this imagination. How can the world be different uh, and better without using fossil fuels? It's kind of a, uh, it sounds simple, but we are really having a hard time imagining how things could be different. Um, so we end up in this thing of just doing incremental changes, like little tiny fixes. We'll increase the fuel economy of the car by f five miles per gallon or something. Yeah, that's not going to do it. We need a fundamental shift uh, and fundamental changes. We've delayed too long, so we've got to make some major changes, but it's going to take a reimagining of how we live our lives. It doesn't necessarily mean hardship, it just means we have to think in new ways. It could be a lot better. Uh, you know, the whole animal uh, food industry, which has a huge climate footprint. Well, one of those reimaginations, which to you folks wouldn't be so difficult, but to many others, the idea that they would be vegetarian or vegan is beyond their comprehension. And yet, there are tons of people who have made the conversion and feel better, are healthier, um, live productive lives. There are professional athletes who've done the same thing and said it's really helped improve their ath athleticism. So, but those are kind of things that people uh, need help imagining how the future and how things can be different. <sighs> Planting trees. So I like this as a cute cartoon that even a, a child can make a difference. Very often children are much more receptive to these uh, messages of the need for changes. Um, and they have an innate desire to want to protect the environment, to protect nature. Uh, somehow we, they lose that as they go through years of school, probably. Um, and yes, that's one way, planting trees, planting plants, generally. This is what's coming because there is a change in the wind. So we've gotten a lot more solar, a lot more wind. It's cheaper now. Uh, in India, it's actually cheaper. Solar is now cheaper than some of their coal plants, like brand new building, brand new solar. It's cheaper uh, than operating their old coal plants because they were so inefficient. And so they're rapidly shifting to solar and wind in India, also in China, also in the US, also in Canada, pretty well everywhere in the world because now it's one of the cheapest forms of energy. And becoming more and more practical. There's still some technical problems of grid and, and that kind of thing, but it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. And that's one projection from Bloomberg, which uh, looks at this stuff. And more and more money, is, more money is being invested now in uh, green energy than in black energy. Um, it needs to happen faster and faster. That's, it needs to ramp up. It can't be uh, simply uh, a little bit at a time. Uh, Hopefully that's going to happen. Um, 
Yeah, so on a more practical level, somebody mentioned Elon Musk the other day. And yeah, he kind of changed the uh, thinking about electric cars by producing a super nice, super sexy, fast electric vehicle that was practical because it had a re decent range. Um, yeah, it was ridiculously expensive, but uh, he proved it could be done and then has now launched his more affordable version. And so that's shifted the entire uh, industry. You keep in mind that when Musk introduced his cheaper Model 3 car two years ago, I guess, um, they had 500,000 orders, like within a month, for a car that didn't exist yet, a car nobody would seen other than in this little video presentation. Uh, and that he told people would be 18 months before you could even get one. And so 500,000 peop uh, people put down a $1,000 deposit on top of that. I mean, that is something that shook up the car industry uh, like nothing else uh, in the last, uh, the last century, I think. Because uh, some of the big car companies, they don't sell 500,000 cars a year. And here was people buying cars that didn't exist yet. For, from a company that was tiny and could go out of business at any time, and they would be patiently waiting for 18 months. So that changed, and so as a result, now all the car companies want to build electric cars. Turns out it's not that hard. Turns out electric cars are far more efficient than fossil fuel cars, just from an energy point of view. Uh, their engines work much more efficiently. Um, and they are easier to make because they have way fewer parts. So manufacturing electric cars is actually going to be cheaper once there's enough uh, volume. And that's coming close now. Um, so they're easier to make, they're cheaper to make. The battery costs have gone way down and continue to go down. It won't be too long before electric cars will be cheaper than a fossil fuel car. And they'll have comparable ranges, whatever, 400, 500 miles. Maybe not, yeah, around there. And the charging infrastructure, one of the things that this funny, this article is all about, the transition from horses to Model Ts. So, oh, how long did it take to go from everybody riding around on horses with New York worrying about all the manure piling up in the streets uh, to uh, there not being any horses at all? It was like within 15 years. It went from everybody on a horse to everybody in a Model T. It happened really fast. And it was a bigger transition because Horses didn't need paved roads. Cars did. And so the roads had to be paved. Gasoline stations had to be built. The oil industry hadn't, was just getting started. They had to start making oil. So there was, a, there was far more hurdles in that transition to uh, the Model T than uh, the one we're facing to go to electric vehicles. Now, electric vehicles aren't the answer for everything. Uh, we still need good uh, transit. So electric trains would be nice. I mean, I, I enjoyed the New Jersey uh, uh, train from the airport into uh, Penn Station, just like traveling in Europe, which is all electric trains. Um, and their trains go really fast in Europe, like 200 miles an hour. Um, so most times you don't need to fly anywhere. You could just take a train. And they're super comfortable, and you don't have to go through the same kind of security nonsense. Um, it's a much more civilized way to travel. Now, hopefully, then that can happen here too. So, I think that's my last slide because I'm filling in for somebody today. Um, it's climate change is a you know a threat to humanity in many many respects. It's mostly a threat to our way of living, our current economy, which needs to shift to a, a more energy efficient economy. Um, but we also have to change a lot of our behaviors and habits, food being one of them. And we need to get on this right away uh, because um, the physics of climate is not going to wait for anybody. Uh, to tell you a short little anecdote. So at the Copenhagen climate change meeting in 2009, I met the, uh, the chief science advisor to the German government. Um, now Angela Merkel is the, well, uh, chancellor, I guess, so like the president. And uh, she's a physicist, actually, so, you know, one of the few leaders who's actually a science trained. But she had a science advisor who's a specialist in climate change. 
And she lent him to the Obama administration during the Copenhagen talks to sort of say, okay, well, you don't have to believe your own scientist. How about this German scientist? Um, and so they talked uh, about it. And this German scientist said to me, he was stunned at the reception. They understood what he was talking about. And they accepted climate change and all the rest of it. But they said, you know, um, you got to give us a politically realistic solution to acting on climate. And he was kind of stumped on that one. He said, well, you know, I just explained the physics of climate doesn't care what people think. It just does its thing. You can't negotiate it with it. You can't bargain with it. It's just going to do what it's going to do if we keep putting emissions out. So the only way to uh, do anything about it is to stop putting emissions. And we have to do it at this rate in order to avoid these really bad consequences. And they said, well, yeah, 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 but we need a politically realistic solution here. He said, there isn't one. You know, there's just plain physics of CO2, heat, bad things happen. The only solution is to cut the amount of CO2 down. So he was stumped that these guys kept saying you had to have a politically realistic solution. And, you know, in truth, um, that is one of the biggest dilemmas that we face, is solutions that are politically realistic. So the electric vehicle thing, that's now become a politically realistic. So sup governments could support that effort. So Norway, for instance, most of their, almost all their uh, new car sales are electric vehicles. Now, Norway is a really cold country, so the, actually the batteries don't work as good in the cold. Uh, but they work fine, you just don't get as much uh, range. But the reason why so many electric vehicles in Norway, and they hope to have 100% of their vehicles in, I think, five years now, is government support. So electric vehicles can park for free everywhere, they get a uh, special tax discount, they get this, they get free electricity charging, um, they get a lot of benefits uh, to go with it. Uh, their, their electric cars are cheaper to buy in Norway than a fossil fuel car because there's, there's hardly any tax on them. So governments can do a lot to make this happen, and Norway has decided, yeah, we're going to be the first country to be 100% electric vehicle. That was politically realistic, and it's a conservative government. It's not like a progressive green government. It's actually a very conservative government. Uh, so that's going to reduce their emissions a whole bunch, and turns out people really like driving electric vehicles because they're super quiet. Um, they go like heck. Um, and it's just much more pleasant to drive, uh, driving them. Uh, so, so governments can play a role here, politically realistic, mm, solar panels. These things are happening because uh, uh, government can make things happen a lot faster. And that is starting to happen. Companies as well, as companies decide they're not going to be in Recently, some of the big fossil fuel companies have said, oh, yeah, we're going to get to wind and solar, too. We're buying wind and solar. Uh, I think the British Petroleum BP, no, not BP. Uh, the, some of the big companies are actually now getting, putting electric charging stations in their gas stations uh, and letting people charge for free. Eventually, of course, they'll charge. But, um, so things are moving along. And that's the kind of politically realistic uh, things that can happen, but we need to push that envelope of what's politically realistic because, like I said, the physics doesn't care about our politics. It only responds to changes in the atmosphere, and those changes are not going to be good for us, and they're going to be super expensive. So let's all try and do what we can to reduce our own emissions and push our leaders to do the same. Thank you. Okay, um, great. Um, so there's not w one thing the climate change. I think that CS2, it's um, the sun. Um, it's another factor because um, there are different different temperature from the sun that's coming to the earth or something else. And another thing is, um, animals produce a lot of gas from methane, and it's m much more than CO2, I think, so for the climate. 
Yeah, so there's um, uh, yeah, the sun has different uh, amounts of heat, let's say, it gives off. Varies a little bit, not, not, turns out not that much. Um, and that, of course, scientists have taken that into account. Uh, the methane from animal emissions is a potent source of uh, climate change warming. It's not as important as CO2 for one reason, especially, is that uh, methane uh, doesn't last very long in the atmosphere, about 20 years. It dissipates, becomes CO2, actually. Um, so it's a short-lived uh, climate uh, change gas, whereas carbon CO2 is a much, much longer-lived uh, uh, gas. Um, but to get our temperature, keep the planet from getting super hot, we have to act on both. We have to act on methane and on CO2, as well as ozone, uh, which is another greenhouse gas even more, um, or not ozone, HFCs. Did you, uh, did, have you seen the, the new uh, uh, products coming out by Tesla? They have a semi-truck that actually has a range of 700 miles uh, with, uh, and they could charge while they're offloading. Uh, that would be ready to go today except for the infrastructure is not set up uh, for them. And they also have a pickup truck that uh, will have a, like a 600 mile range. Uh, and the semis also, we won't have to worry about on the highways anymore about the heavy loads taking so long to go uphill and the dangerous when they're going slow mm -hmm. because they have much more power. They have uh, to where they could keep the speed limit going up a, a 6% grade. Uh, so um, when that comes in at 2020, I think that's going to make a huge difference, you know, as to a lot of the petrol fuels, yeah. um, you know, but uh, it's, it's converting everything over and what's holding them back is how now is the government going to collect <laughs> all the fuel stamp tax and the tax and the tax and the tax on fuels if we no longer use it. Yeah, yeah there's a perverse, that's a perverse incentive when you think about um, even increasing the uh, miles per gallon. The government makes money based on how much gasoline is consumed. The more it's consumed, the more money in taxes government takes, especially at the state level. So, you know, <laughs> I think it's, it's kind of like the cigarette tax, the same idea. Governments make a lot, a lot of money off cigarettes, so why would they ever get rid of them? Even though the health benefits would be tremendous to uh, the economy and to people. Um, same case for uh, the gasoline taxes. So that's going to be one of the hurdles and one of the reasons why governments haven't been all that keen. Because let's not forget all this CO2 talk. Foss burning fossil fuels pollutes the air. It pollutes the air here. It pollutes the air everywhere. It's not just those horrible scenes in, in, uh, in uh, China. We're all affected by pollution when you go into the city or near a highway. There's tons of studies that link the health effects to even what we uh, think is actually low levels of pollution, heart attacks, uh, uh, asthma attacks, all that kind of thing. Happens not just on smog days, it happens on a regular basis. We're just not that aware of it. Um, so getting rid of fossil fuels would be a huge benefit to all of our health. Um, so you think governments would support that too because it reduces medical bills and all that kind of stuff. But there's the tax issue and um, as you point out, there are alternatives, Tesla being one, building these uh, giant trucks. Uh, other companies too. All the big truck companies now are jumping onto electric vehicles too and companies have already made orders for these vehicles because they went, once they saw this could actually work, there's huge economic advantages to them as well. Um, and that they're more efficient. Uh, so the market's already, um, uh, you know, it's gonna grow quickly. It's just a question of how fast can they make them. Uh, we could talk all day about the financial benefits of continuing fossil fuels. Um, I wanted to mention, this is more of a comment, you know, electric vehicles, seem great, but they still have to be charged. And I know Tesla has created solar charging stations, but those are few and far between right now. So they have to be charged from existing electric sources, which could be coal or nuclear or natural gas. And you know, those are all you know, terrible <laughs> sources. We don't really have a truly clean electric source. Yeah. And then for all the millions of vehicles 
you know, especially semis, they all run on rubber tires, which are, you know, there's multiple gallons of oil in every tire. So an 18-wheeler has 18 wheels and there's seven gallons per tire or something like that. So I think that's a step in the right direction, but unless we can clean it up, and exactly as you said, there, there is no politically correct solution to climate change, and our politicians, sadly, are all more worried about re-election than truly solving these global problems, and Mother Nature doesn't care who gets elected. She's going to take us over the cliff, you know, if we don't do something. Um, food choices are huge. I know Jim Hicks spoke here last year talking about food choices being, you know, the, the first thing we can change. Um, we don't have to wait for legislation or technology or fundraising, we can change our diet with mm -hmm. the decision, you know, flip the switch in your brain. And except for people who live in food deserts who don't have access to healthy foods, you know, there's very few people on this planet who have to eat animals because they live in places where that's all they can, can eat, like Inuits or, you know, populations like that. So that's one comment. Um, and the other, you know, 800-pound gorilla in the room is population, and we're adding 220,000 people to the planet a day. That's, you know, more than a million a week. And, you know, we have to stop breeding, and nobody's talking about that. You know, breeding animals, you know, the 80 billion land animals that we breed to slaughter and eat, and trillions of sea creatures, and humans. And, you know, I'm on Facebook a lot, and my friends that are my age are all bragging about their grandkids and, you know, younger people are having children. I would hate to, you know, I have two kids, so I, I bred, I duplicated myself and, you know, but nowadays we really have to think about, you know, bringing fewer people into this world because we can't sustain that type of growth, maybe even for a few more years. I know we're talking about what happens in 2050 or 2090 or 2100. We may not have that much time at the rate we're expanding our population and raising animals. Even the dog and cat population, you know, nobody needs to be breeding animals, period. So any comments on that? Uh, well, uh, that's a, there's a lot there, but um, certainly from a point of view of human population, th the numbers are actually starting to come down. Um, uh, you know, lots of studies show as people become better educated, uh, they have uh, less children. Um, the other part is, you know, um, a typical North American CO2 emitter person, you know, has 20 times the footprint, you know, so the size of this, the amount of CO2 is 20 times greater than uh, somebody in sub-Saharan Africa. So there's like, well, who's, who is there too many of? Um, so you get out of there's too many, uh, um, middle class and upper class folks, because we're the ones who consume by far the most, uh, or produce the most CO2. Um, so that there's that issue, um, which doesn't take anything away from what you're saying. Um, the other thing is, obviously we could do a lot better than we're doing in terms of efficiency and in terms of reducing our CO2. Uh, and therefore, meaning we could have more people. Um, but the numbers are coming down, and I think there's going to be a state where um, there'll be sort of a, a, a number that we'll get to, hopefully not hugely more than we have now, that will make it uh, more of a stable situation. But uh, those, are, those are all the kinds of issues that we need to be talking about. Um, and, you know, obviously not pointing fingers at they're, they're the problem, we're the problem, who's the problem? We're all in this together, and we can all contribute. Yeah? For the solution, um, when you mentioned BP, I was thinking, well, BP was the oil spill in the Gulf. Um, what about organizing lists that are available for everybody on the, uh, on the internet, which has now been made available even to, to the, the smallest countries through these cloud things that, that fantastic technology that floats the possibility of internet uh, all over the world. Um, making a list by industry of all the companies that are workable for our planet mm. and having that available to every 
housewife and house husband and child when they're looking at what to get, having the teachers become a, aware of those choices at schools, just making that free as this conference has been so graciously made free to everybody so that before you do anything, mm -hmm. buy anything, you, you just see what companies you want to get their, give money to, to support. And ha that sounds too simple somehow. Uh, no, it's not, it's a good, it's a good idea because uh, uh, people can't do all uh, you know, research to figure out who's, who's doing the right thing and who isn't. Uh, there are some lists of that, of, of companies who um, are incorporating climate change into their uh, strategies and some companies uh, that have made a commitment to uh, reduce their emissions to zero. C can you imagine at all these college fairs where people come and they mm -hmm. have a booth, having somebody with these lists available, yeah. for which company do you want to support? Take a look and see if any of them are here. Yeah. And, and, and getting um, Bill Gates, the foundation, getting him uh, bringing to attention that this is possible and having him support getting these lists out to everybody. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. I mean, there is uh, beginnings, there are some organizations, there's 100% renewable, uh, I think it's RE 100% is the website. And so they have communities that have gone 100% renewable, like so little small towns and, and, uh, and some cities that have committed to 100% renewable in 10 years. I think San Francisco is actually one of them. Um, and then there's another group that's, I think it's 100 by 100 by 100. Anyway, so the idea is 100% renewable energy, 100% electric vehicles for these companies, and 100% for something else, which I can't remember. Um, so it's, there, are, there is that starting to happen, this, this kind of listing. And making that available, yeah. and making it available for update, and just what's so important is to have it have people know that this exists. Yes, yeah, I agree. And I, it's something that the media needs to cover a lot more. I've been trying to figure out how to get uh, 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 to, uh, you know, write some stories about it, but also to get them uh, published because, you know, it's the, the latest disaster is always the uh, uh, favorite uh, topic for uh, most media outlets, so. Um, Berkshire Hathaway, hmm. if, if you have one share of that, you can go to a conference of all the people there and you yeah. can speak to him. And if Warren Buffett made known that this list was available and all you had to do was go to a website, that would be such an, I mean, ev or everybody who does or doesn't have a Earthway back, uh, Berkshire Hathaway yeah. chair would, ha ha it would make the news. Yeah, 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 it's a good idea. Okay. <clears throat> and you're talking about you know, sustaining the, 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 the world. Uh, is, is any availability to uh, Agenda 21 trying to depopulate the, the Earth? No. Thank you. The Agenda 21 thing um, it was one of the first stories I ever wrote uh, on climate, related to climate change. And so it came out 22, three years ago or something. And it was kind of like a... It was like a policy wonk document by a few people um, that actually went nowhere. You know, it got written sort of related to the first Rio conference, the big first environmental conference uh, 22, three years ago. And, uh, you know, people went, oh yeah, that's nice. Like all sorts of UN things that happen, there's tons of reports and they make a bit of a show and then it disappears. Uh, so there's nothing to it. Thank you. Um, I think you said those that contribute the least greenhouse gases will suffer the, l most. the most. Yeah. What? I, can oh, you so it's the uh, it's the countries, the poor countries that don't actually emit very much CO2, that are being impacted because they're, they're generally in the south uh, part of the world where a lot of impacts are already happening. They're also where they can't buffer themselves from the impacts. So when you have a heat wave, let's say in Pakistan. Uh, that's, you know, 130 degrees or 140 degrees, which they've had. What do people do? They don't have 
a lot of air conditioning. So they die. So thousands have died in Pakistan and India in the last few years from heat waves, tens of thousands, um, because they can't get cool because they don't have access to air conditioning. So in the richer countries, we can afford air conditioning, cooling stations. Yeah, we still have some fatalities, but nowhere near uh, the scale. Similarly, for hurricane damages or sea level rises that are affecting things, um, uh, the impacts are greater because they don't have the resources to uh, protect themselves from these changes. Thank you very much for the, um, you know, this great information. Um, the way I, I see it is, you know, it's, it's very complicated, right? But what we can, it's hard to change other people and change a system. Mm -hmm. What we can do is just at least change ourselves, right? So I, I did place a $1,000 deposit on a Model 3. Yeah. And my roof is about to do, you know, to replace the roof, it's going to cost another ten fifteen thousand. 15000 So why not install the, the, the uh, Tesla you know, solar roof to, again, convert and use that energy. And that, that will charge my, my uh, Model 3 that's coming, hopefully, <laughs> right? And, yeah. and with the power wall, I can conserve the, save the energy, and as well as use it at nighttime. So it'll probably be off the grid. Personally, I could, you know, go vegan, right? Again, that leaves a lot less carbon footprint. And it's healthy, right? It all makes sense. But in terms of, this is what I can do, and then show my friends, my family, teach my kids to live the lifestyle that will minimize everything. And that will hopefully spread. When they see that, that this lifestyle is great, and I save money, energy, and everything, then, you know, why not? Won't, you know, they'll follow through, right? Mm -hmm. But in terms of the big picture, the, one of the biggest problems is how, you know, the powers, the people in power are so corrupt. Right, you have all these big companies that all these monies that buying all the politicians and making it work for them instead of you know the society, the government, the people. So, you know, if the government, the president, the Congress, the judges, everybody can be bought and can be corrupted, then you know, there is no political solution to this until that stops. That that's what I you know, how I think it has to stop political solutions actually to stop that corruption that's happening and 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 then you know like people like Elon Musk with all these great visions and, and creating these products that is beneficial for all for society then you know support them support all those people all those co companies that are in that in that way so that's that's how I see it well, thanks yeah, yeah it's a good point that's a little beyond my remit but I would agree with you Money in politics is a, a huge issue in much of the world. Uh, here, obviously, it's been a, getting to be a bigger and bigger problem. Um, yeah, I think what happens, hopefully, is you know, folks like you who do these things, who are making these changes, suddenly make these other companies unprofitable, so they can't afford to dole out millions of dollars in campaign funding uh, they end up going bankrupt like a lot of the coal companies are now. Um, and yeah, they're going to hang on by their claws and do whatever they can to stay in business, but the tide's already turned, um, so they're going to go down. Uh, they're just going to make it messier and more difficult, you know, so we have to be stubborn and persistent uh, to keep on doing the right thing and pushing for change. Because the alternative is, you know, revolution. Because the climate impacts will get so severe, people will tear the oil and gas and coal infrastructure apart with their bare hands. Because they'll know this is the reason why, you know, the weather is killing my kids and ruining my life and preventing our, you know, uh, economy from being able to do anything uh, uh, beneficial for us. So, you know, we don't want to go that way. Um, but that's the inevitable outcome. Um, so any reasonable person would not want to take the risk and you would want to act. And you're a reasonable people, so I'm sure you already are acting uh, and uh, will continue to do so. But it's, you know, it just seems to me pretty insane to not uh, want to make these changes given the huge 
consequences and risks we're going to face. Any other questions? Oh, just hang a sec. You know, earlier on you made a statement that uh, CO2 in the atmosphere lasts forever. What about uh, plants and all that? You know, the photosynthesis. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, plants can absorb, do absorb CO2. So that's the, you know, way in which we can help reduce the amount of CO2. I mean, the CO2 is still in the plant. It's just taken from the atmosphere into the plant. Uh, and when the plant dies, it'll emit that CO2 again. It will release it, unless it's sort of trapped under the ground in the soil. And then it becomes part of the soil carbon, which is really good for growing stuff. Um, so one of the bigger sources of uh, CO2 emissions is deforestation, cut the forest down. We've lost that CO2 uh, sponge that trees are, uh, and then emitted a bunch more CO2 because of the cutting, up, cutting down the trees and they rot and emit more CO2. Um, so, so yes, planting more trees, you know, Earth was once pretty well all forest on the land. There was very few deserts at one time. Um, you know, the U.S. being a good example was almost all except for the prairies, forests. And same with Canada, virtually all forests. Uh, so we've lost the vast majority of the planet's forests, which helped keep our uh, climate stable. Planting more forests, keeping more forests is, uh, you know, win-win. It's good for biodiversity, which is a whole other topic which I haven't gone into yet, uh, or have not going to get into today. Um, which is the life support system of the entire planet because it all works together. Um, and uh, forests are a big part of that, so. Just added, just added to the to-do list is a list of speakers such as yourself <laughs> being circulated to all the schools mm. around, the, uh, around this country and around the world and having a, a government budget for that, um, getting the EPA behind that. Because these presentations that have been here at this conference, you can't come away the same. You just can't. Hmm. And uh, I, so Steve would be the a perfect person to make that list up um, and then get Bill Gates to, to sponsor the dissemination of it and maybe pay for the speakers. You know, that, that would be such a step forward. I would love that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that, that would be a great idea. Uh, and I'm always happy to talk to kids, um, get their energy, get their ideas. It's, it's always a very productive for me as, as well as for them, I hope. Um, and even topics like, serious topics like climate change. I have done talks, uh, ser very serious ones, about the future of climate change for 14-year-olds. And, you know, there was some resistance. This was a like a prep school, I guess, sort of a, all of, <laughs> basically said, you guys can't do what your parents are doing. You can't live the lifestyles and you can't have the kind of same kind of jobs. Um, yeah, they didn't invite me back, but um, I think it went over really well because about half the class got really excited about the idea and the challenge because it's going to require creativity, cooperation um, to solve this. Um, so there's an opportunity for you know, sort of making your own way and, and finding some really, uh, you know, exciting things to do with your life um, as opposed to following in the footsteps of mom and dad. Um, now, as I say, half the class liked that idea, the other half did not. Yeah. What kind of effect does uh, jet engine contrails leave in, in the atmosphere? There are so many jets out there and I see lines all the time. Yeah. Does that affect the ozone or anything in any way, shape or form? Um, well, there they definitely emit uh, CO2, uh, but just on the contrail thing, uh, it's not chemtrails. There's no chemicals being sprayed. Um, I get this question a lot. Um, the, and the, the couple of effects. One is the, um, the cloud cover actually cools because it reflects the, you know, the contrails are kind of a thin cloud and it bounces some of the heat energy from the sun uh, up. Um, so after 9-11, when there was no flights over the U.S., temperatures went up quite a bit 
because it, there would normally there'd be a lot of contrails that would uh, actually was a scientific uh, study on that. Um, so they have that beneficial effect. Downside is uh, they emit a lot of CO2 uh, and are, you know, small percentage, but it's like 3%, I think, maybe of emissions comes from uh, the airline industry, but it's still millions and millions of tons of CO2. Um, there's electric planes now. And one of the big, I think it's Airbus in Europe, is committed to short-range electric, electric planes. So there's already planes, like small planes, like a Piper Cub or something, that will fly for a couple hours on, on a battery. And there's a solar-powered plane that went around the world, yeah, which was amazing. Now, those guys were crazy, uh, uh, but <laughs> anyways. Um, and uh, so there's commercial aviation now looking at passenger planes, small ones to begin with, that will operate on electric. So as batteries get better, and maybe a new technology for battery will come, or some kind of capacitor uh, way of uh, using uh, charging energy. Um, so there's some shifting uh, going on, and you know that would be terrific. I mean, I myself had to fly here because I figured out it would take me something like 22 hours to come by train, and it's diesel train. So um, yeah, in Europe again, you can get around on electric trains very easily. Uh, not so in here, obviously. But if I get a Tesla like your Tesla, I'll drive instead. <laughs> and I'll make sure I charge from the solar powered ones. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, if you would like to get uh, his book that is uh, signed, you can um, buy it here, and he will sign it for you. Uh, we're going to take a, this free vegan ice cream. We're going to be back at uh, two o'clock with uh, James Howard Kunstler, who will be uh, speaking on the long emergency up close and personal. And we want to thank. Uh, the Hippocrates Health Institute for being a sponsor of this lecture. If you call up Hippocrates and ask, tell them you want the real truth about health advantage, they will give you a 10% discount um, on a stay at Hippocrates during the conference. Um, also, if you haven't signed up for the raffle, please go to our website, sign in to the live stream, and on the right there's a green button, and you can sign up for all those great raffle prizes. See you back at 2 o'clock and have some vegan ice cream. Thanks. <laughs>